Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Jessica Dean. I'm a technical evangelist for Microsoft. If there's anyone in the room who was at my session yesterday, some of the slides will be the same because we're gonna cover DevOps, but then we're gonna get into a little bit of different content that we covered yesterday. Um, so just bear with me a little bit. So again, I am a technical evangelist for Microsoft. What a technical evangelist is, is I get paid to talk to people about technology. It's pretty much a dream job. Uh, prior to joining Microsoft, I was a Linux systems administrator for a med device company. Uh, I had been around Microsoft for about four or five years as a vendor and MVP. For some reason, they gave me an award in Windows four years in a row, and I had more Apple certifications than I did Microsoft. Uh, I have always been a big proponent about technology, but not just Microsoft platform or Linux platform or Apple platform. I like technology that works, and I like making it work well together. So as a result, I get to talk to people about this for a living. Uh, with my MacBook Pro, with my iPhone, Surface Pro is in my bag in case anybody wants to have Microsoft also up here, but we are at a Linux conference, so I figured that'd be a little weird. <laughs> so moving into some things, we are seeing a shift in <coughs> IT and operations and developers. We're seeing a shift in our field. So how many people in the room already work in the enterprise? Okay. How many people are trying to get into the enterprise or considering careers in the enterprise? I'm not sure how many people we have college age. Okay, so we have kind of a good mixture. So back to 10, 15 years ago, we're seeing a big shift into today's technology and how we have uh, technology delivered today. We now have everybody has a mobile device, everybody has a computer, a tablet, everybody's always connected. So there's more demand. There's more demand from IT, there's more demand from developers. Everybody wants things immediate. We have social networks that are so rampant where everyone expects immediate delivery. That puts a lot of stress on IT, that puts a lot of stress on developers. It's estimated that one million per devices per hour will be going online by 2020. The average age of S&P corporations by 2020 will be 500. Compare that to 70 was the average age back in the 1950s. So we've, we're drastically cutting the age of, tech, of companies themselves. Uh, and then it's also estimated that 60% of computing in the public cloud is supposed to be done by 2025. I actually think that that's a really low percentage. That's about 10 years away. We already have a good majority of computing happening in the public cloud. If it's not all done in the public cloud, we have a hybrid scenario going on in a lot of enterprises or a lot of companies are considering that hybrid scenario today. So IT stress points from the IT part of the room, just uh, out of curiosity, how many people in here fall on the IT operation side? Okay, how many fall on the developer side? How many people fall in between and just wear whatever hat's given to them? There we go. So I was in that boat for a long time as well. But in, in either point, both IT and dev tends to deal with the same stress points. There's security threats that both groups have to deal with. There's data center efficiency. Even if, data, uh, if developers don't necessarily have to deal with that, they get frustrated when things aren't as efficient as they should be. Um, and then we also have to support innovation because we're seeing this change. So we're living in this mobile first, cloud first world where everybody's hearing, it's all about the cloud, it's all about the cloud. You have your grandmother talking about the cloud. You have uh, this mobile first world where I mentioned everybody has a device, everybody's connected. From an IT and developer perspective, how do we handle that? And from a company perspective, from Microsoft, how do we give you the tools that will better equip you to handle that? So that's what this talk's gonna be about today. We're gonna go over DevOps, we're gonna go over open source, we're gonna go over Linux, and we're gonna talk about how Microsoft now plays a key role in all of that. And then we're gonna also talk about the cloud and how, that, how the cloud can help you in all three of those areas. So first off, we're gonna talk about Azure. Azure is Microsoft's cloud platform. How many people in the room know what Azure is? Before I just mention that, great. How many people have used Azure? How many people are considering using Azure and are interested? Okay, great. Um, so Azure is the most trusted cloud. We have more secure uh, awards than any of our competitors. Cloud itself, since we're talking about Azure, is a new way to think about the data center. Your previous model, you had a physical entity with physical servers and physical infrastructure and purpose-built hardware sitting in a data center. Now you can have everything up in the cloud, as your grandmother calls it. For some reason, there's always air quotes tied into it. So the cloud model is now you have loosely coupled apps in IaaS or PaaS, whether that's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, you have these services that are now sitting in the cloud in Microsoft's data centers or Amazon's data centers or Google's data centers, depending on your cloud provider you're using. So we're changing how we're delivering technology to our end users. 
So with that, we're changing how processes and configurations happen, ha happen. And we have to now consider how we're going to implement that with a plan, where now we start tying in DevOps practices. So th that comes into where let's talk about DevOps. It's a three-stage conversation. It's not a tool you can go out and buy. It's not something you go out and go to Fry's or I don't, I'm not from here, so I actually don't know what the local tech store would be. Uh, but it's, it's a mindset, it's a culture, it's something that we as developers in IT have to implement so that we can start working together and collaborating together rather than fighting so that we both can deliver the end goal to our customers. So the first part is people, and then we have to identify process. We have to have a plan. We can't just say, there's a web app, I'm gonna code it and push it. Great, it's done, because that always works. So we have to have a process, and then we have to talk about our products. And so from Microsoft's perspective, we have products that can help you with the process, so long as we're talking to the right people. And so that's the other part of it, is since this talk is about open source and Microsoft and DevOps, one of the things that Microsoft had to do is we had to listen to our customers. We had to listen to people and hear what you guys were saying to us. So we did, and that's where we were able to take the feedback we were given and put that into the cloud, put that into Azure, put that into the tools that we offer. So the first part of process is we have to plan. As I mentioned, we have to have a plan for where we're going. After we have a plan and we start off development, we can now start to enter the develop and test stage. After develop and test, we're gonna go ahead and release that. Whether we release that to a pilot group for end users or we release that to prod, we are always gonna end up having that release stage. After release, we wanna monitor and learn from what we just released. So we need a tool that's gonna to give us application insights, that's gonna give us metrics, that's gonna give us the ability to scale in case CPU percentage is overwhelming on a weekend. Uh, I don't know, shopping website uh, makes an update of some kind, announces a big sale, and now they're slammed with 50,000 more requests than they normally do, and the website crashes. That's gonna be a fun call on the weekend when you're at Disneyland with your family. So how do we scale that? How do we have tools that we can monitor and learn from those inci incidents so we can prevent that from happening in the future? That's kind of this mindset of DevOps. So one person, before everyone got in the room, one person had mentioned on how he'd been doing DevOps for 20 years before the key already existed or before the word already existed. I've heard that from a lot of people. A lot of people are using DevOps and don't realize it. A lot of people are working for a company where they're the CEO or CTO has heard the new term, DevOps. I want you to go out and implement DevOps. Go out and buy that, put that in. Okay, they don't know what it is. You may have already been using it. You may have been wanting to use it because you already, from the IT perspective, you already have a plan. You already know that you have to test. You already know that you have to monitor, but you don't have the support from a company that's going to back you on that. That's where you can make certain subtle suggestions with the tools that we'll talk about today. So a list of common DevOps practices that you may not even realize you've already been using. Infrastructure as code, that's a big one. If you worked on the IT side of things, your previous deployment for infrastructure might be imaging. How many people in the room still image systems to, for their end users? So I'm very impressed, that's awesome. So if you were still using imaging, that was the, that was the previous way of delivering a system to an end user delivering code. Now we have this infrastructure as code where I need to stand up this server, I need to stand up this web app. I can script it out in a bash script and a PowerShell script and then push that to a repository to deliver that to my customers. That's infrastructure as code. We can use tools for a continuous integration and continuous deployment. Tools like that would be CodeShip, VSTS, Jenkins. Uh, all of those tools, we have ties in for Azure. So we can support that continuous integration where you're gonna get the testing and automation part of it and then you're gonna get your deployment where it's gonna push either, if you're doing a web app, you can push it to a QA slot, and then you can swap that slot over to production after it's been tested. If you're doing a container service, you can push it to the cloud through container service. Containers are a new way to think of DevOps. There's all these different options that now exist from practices that we're able to put into more than just a product, it's a service. So benefits of implementing DevOps is you have strong performance and a competitive advantage because now you're working together as a team. You're not just reactive in IT or developers where you have to fix this code that was broken yesterday, but you have three more projects due at the end of the week. Uh, you're able to improve performance. You can deploy code 30 times faster because you're implementing these practices and you're gonna, have, you're gonna end up having 60 times fewer failures. 
So here's some building blocks that Microsoft has put in. And we have it kind of for all scenarios. If you notice, we have building blocks for DevOps for on-prem, hybrid, and cloud. So it's beyond just Azure. But what we did well in Azure, what we heard we were doing well from our customers, we brought down into an on-prem platform because some customers aren't ready to go to the cloud and that's okay. So the latest operating system for server that we released last October was Server 2016. That is our very first cloud-ready operating system where what we did well in the cloud, we brought down onto an on-prem operating system. And you can tie that in to a hybrid environment if you want to use System Center and Hyper-V server. Uh, we made several changes to Hyper-V and how we improved the performance. We also brought additional support for Linux, which previously did not exist. Uh, then we also have release management, lab management, if you're using Team Foundation services, Visual Studio. Microsoft actually open sourced Visual Studio Code, which we'll talk about a little bit as well. We open sourced a few other things. We, we're intentionally giving you every tool we can think of to make your job easier and your life easier. So we ultimately are thinking about that process. We're planning, we're helping you develop and test. We wanna help you be able to reach that next release and then give, give you the tools to have insight and to be able to monitor and learn from it. So architecture decisions when you're considering this. And this is where really we'll focus back on cloud and Azure. Azure can offer you IS, containers, platform as a service, and then Azure websites, which is a different version of platform as a service. We're actually gonna do a demo of this a little bit later today. So IaaS is going to give you the most management control because it's, it's individual infrastructure you're used to. You're standing up your server, you're standing up your VNet, you're standing up your VLANs, you're standing up your individual services. And it has, we offer support to tie into Puppet, Chef, uh, PowerShell desired state configuration, easier to report workloads. You have complete control over it versus let's say that you want to do containers. Microservices and containers are the new way you can think about DevOps because you're taking just one container, spin up this Nginx website, spin up this uh, MySQL database, spin up this WordPress app, and you're keeping them in containers. Rather than having hardware virtualization, which we've had for 10, 15 years, and if you've used Hyper-V or VMware mm -hmm. ESXi, you're familiar with that, or ES ESX. But now we're taking that and we're making it one step further with containers where we have operating system virtualization. And so you're actually oper uh, virtualizing the kernel on top of that. So that's where things get a little bit more fun. Uh, Server 2016 offers actually Windows containers as well as of October of last year. The next part of it is platform as a service where you can do start startup tasks, more complex wor workloads. You can do a little bit more than websites and it supports ARM. So Microsoft likes to take acronyms and words that already exist and have a mindset that people already know what ARM or containers mean. And then we like to repurpose it sometimes for our own use. So ARM, or, or this is actually APM com compatible, but ARM in uh, Microsoft is Azure Resource Manager. And so that allows you to take things kind of as objects and move them around into groups or resource groups. And we also like to refer to resource groups sometimes as containers, because it's a giant bucket where you can put your resources or your objects that you're storing either from a platform as a service, each one of these, we'll, we'll go through that in the demo, but each one of these options or architecture groups is going to give you resources that exist in a resource group. And the next part of that is Azure Websites, which is really just platform as a service. You can tie right in easy CI and CD setup. That's gonna be the demo we kind of go through today. We're gonna tie in GitHub. If anybody was in my session yesterday, ideally they're not doing maintenance on webhooks but we're gonna tie GitHub into our Azure container service for our web app, and when we push to GitHub, that's gonna deploy off an Azure website. So you also have easy testing, because you can swap in platform as a service, you can create different deployment slots. So I can create one for test, I can create one for QA, I can create one for prod. After it's been vetted and confirmed that it's working in QA, we can just simply swap it over and it automatically be on prod. I don't have to redeploy anything and then wonder what went wrong, why this configuration on this server is different than the configuration on my QA server. I've been there. So this is a lot easier. And then it's easier deployments to scale. You can make those changes where if you know you're gonna get, you're announcing a big sale on the weekend, you know you're gonna get hit with more requests, you can say, hey, scale up this infrastructure, give me another instance of it if CPU perform, uh, usage is over 80%. It's efficient cost because you're only paying for what you're using from an app service plan compared to 
all this infrastructure that you may not need. So it also give you, gives you a lot of flexibility from a startup mindset where you don't have to go out and invest $50,000 into infrastructure in a data center. You can start slow and scale up with the cloud while still starting with these tools, with these practices that you're going to use as you grow bigger from an enterprise mindset. So we also have the Azure Marketplace. Uh, so this part, I love this slide because you have Linux, Oracle, IBM, <laughs> SAP, Informatica, none of this is Microsoft. Over 60% of the images that are in the marketplace are Linux or open source images. So we want to give you every option we can. Right down here, these are all Linux based images. You do have Windows based. We have our recommended is do you want to do Windows Server? Right next to that is Ubuntu Server. So Microsoft is also very big in making sure that Linux is now going to be treated as a first class citizen on Microsoft platforms. We really do have this shift in the way Microsoft is trying to approach the IT community as a whole, not just the previous favorites over there in the Windows corner. So that leads us into we are reimagining Microsoft. Our mission today is that we want to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. How do we do that? We listen to you, listen to the tools you want, and then allow that to allow us to help you through the cloud, through on-prem server, through the tools that we can give you. So our strategy is if we can build the best in-class platforms and productivity services for the mobile first cloud first world, then we can be able to achieve greater things. Our ambitions is that we want to reinvent productivity and business process. We want to build the intelligent cloud platform. That's why we're making changes to Azure by the minute. Half the time I log into my Azure subscription, there's a new tool that I didn't even know about. Um, and then we can create a more personal computing experience and not only personal, we can create a more enter enterprise efficient experience. So our approach to open source in the cloud is enable, integrate, release, and participate. And so that kind of goes back to the four DevOps practices that we talked about. <coughs> enable, we're enabling planning, we're, enable, we're enabling, we know that we have this plan where we wanna spin up this Ubuntu server, we wanna spin up this Python database or uh, Docker or any of these open source tools and so we're enabling users to be able to do that. So we want to enable Linux and open source technology on Mac Microsoft platforms. We want to integrate those. So we support Hadoop, MongoDB, DCOS, Docker Swarm, Redis. One of the talks I did last year actually was talk somebody asked me about running Redis on Bash on Windows, because now you can run Bash on Windows. And it's not a virtual machine. It's not Hyper-V. It is native Ubuntu binaries running on top of Windows. We partnered with Canonical to be able to deliver that. So a customer asked, can I run Redis on it? One of my big pain points of being a Linux systems administrator is when I'm given a Windows system for one customer, for one scenario, I, ha I, I have to go out and get a Linux system for Redis. So we did a demo and got Redis to work. Uh, release, we want to release key Microsoft technologies into the open source domain. So you'll notice on here it's a little small. We have .NET Core right there, TypeScript, F Sharp, .NET Core, when we released that, that set us up to be able to release Visual Studio Code and PowerShell Core. So now from a Linux or Mac system, I can now run PowerShell commands. It's not perfect, it's still in alpha, it is missing commands, but we're getting there. We're trying to take that first step. With Visual Studio Code, I can run Visual Studio Code on any one of my systems, and I prefer it on my Mac. I can make customizations, and from right within Visual Studio Code, have GitHub integration, so I can push directly to my GitHub repo, have my bash terminal, I can change my terminal to PowerShell if I wanted to. I have more control with these open source tools. And then Microsoft wants to start participating. Uh, the mere fact that I, as a Microsoft technical evangelist, am at a Linux conference, that's something you wouldn't hear five, 10 years ago. So our open source investments are fueling the momentum. Like I said, one out of three virtual machines on Azure run Linux, and more than half of new VMs are running Linux. So we're seeing that percentage increase every day. Uh, we actually have Ross Gardler. He's the president of the Apache SW Foundation. He works for Microsoft. He works actually as a product manager on Azure Container Service. I've worked with him on some of the videos that we've released as far as here's how to get started. And he's passionate about technology on open source and Linux. We support Jenkins, we have Red Hat. Uh, Microsoft actually did a uh, Linux Foundation partnership where we actually joined the Linux Foundation, right down there. SQL Server loves Linux. We also have stickers that says Microsoft loves Linux. We really are seeing the shift. Also right here, Windows Subsystem for Linux or WSL. That is Bash on Ubuntu on Windows. 
if you guys want to see a demo of that after, I do have, I can show you that on my Surface and my bag. So now going back to Azure, we're delivering open source innovation in the cloud. So how can we help you on our journey or on your journey? So like we said, or like I said, we're trying to help you guys be better at your job, which means that we actually took everything we've heard over the past 10 years and put it into practice. So we're able to offer you management tools, DevOps and platform as a service tools, applications, framework tools, data, infrastructure. We really wanted to say, okay, here's everything that's being used in the industry. Let's support it in the cloud. Things have changed. This was a title for, or this was an article from 16 years ago where a previous CEO identified Linux as a cancer. This is our current CEO today. And I love this slide because actually the he stood up here on stage and said, this is not your dad's Microsoft anymore. And to me, I actually got into technology because my dad. My dad worked in this field. So I was building computers at three years old, wadding around with 386 sound cards that were bigger than me. I have family home videos of it. Uh, I remember when the, and I know I'm, I'm dating myself here as far as being younger, but I remember when a one gigabyte hard drive came out, I looked at my dad and I said, who's gonna use that much space? Uh, so th this isn't your father's Microsoft anymore. We really have shifted. I started hanging around Microsoft in 2009 as a vendor. It was in April of 2009. And in February of 2010 was the very first time I went to Redmond. The first question I was asked was, you're not one of those people that has an Apple or a Mac or anything, right? Um, hides in the corner. No, of course not. It's really kind of shifted even in the time that I've been around. Uh, now for me showing up, bringing my MacBook, going to conferences, it's, it's a completely different world, which is really nice. We're really seeing this, this growth. I don't know how many people actually know what this is right here, but GitHub did an independent, independent study in October of last year to figure out who the number one contrib contributor was to GitHub open source projects. It's Microsoft. Uh, majority of that number, I will say, is Visual Studio Code contributions. But we beat Facebook, we beat Docker, we beat Google, we beat companies who have been doing it for years. That's what I think is most powerful about this image. The marketplace is even embracing our open source. When we first started getting into it, I think there was definitely a lot of uh, pushback and what's Microsoft doing here? Why is Microsoft trying to do something with Linux? They don't know anything about Linux. I remember going to a DevOps conference last year and being asked, what is Microsoft doing here? You guys don't do anything with DevOps. Well. Now we're starting to see that shift. We're seeing ZDNet recognize it, TechCrunch, Network World, IDG. We're, we're starting to actually make an impact, which is good, but we're not done yet. So it has been a journey. As I mentioned, PowerShell is open source and available on Linux. It's available on Mac as well. Linux Agent, GA uh, for Azure, and Container Solution Preview for Operations Management Suite. If people use OMS on <coughs> Azure, that's available. Azure Resource Manager is actually a community on GitHub, so if you're interested in proving how Azure Resource Manager or ARM works, it's actually available on GitHub. You can submit pull requests to that. Uh, four times growth in container customers in Azure since January, all with Docker on Linux. So while we do offer Windows containers, Docker containers on Linux have already been working for years. I feel like that's most people's comfort level. We're supporting that in the cloud. We're supporting that locally as well. But in the cloud, we offer support for Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, DCOS, and we're growing that. Our goal actually is also to have Azure Container Registry, which is currently in preview, where you can also have your own repo in Azure. One in three VMs in, in Azure, as I mentioned, run Linux today, and over 40% of virtual machines created in new deployments in Azure today are running Linux. So we're seeing this drastic shift and this dra drastic adaptation to tools that we're giving. New, uh, more new Linux features. You actually have Azure Service Fabric for Linux. It's now in preview. Azure Disk Encryption for Linux VMs. And Azure CLI 2.0. So if you were in my talk yesterday, I talked about Azure CLI and I demoed a, some continuous deployment uh, <coughs> scripts uh, or infrastructure's code scripts using it. Previously, we had Azure CLI 1.0, which was written in Node. Now Azure CLI 2.0 is written in Python, and it can do so much more. The previous version couldn't ma manage things like Azure Container Service. It could pretty much create groups, delete groups, and maybe deploy a JSON template. But it was very, very limited. So if we're saying previously, prior to CLI 2.0 existing, if we're standing up here talking to Linux users saying, hey, we want to help you use Azure. We want to help you move to the cloud. We want to help you make your life easier. Oh, but to manage it, you have to use PowerShell on Windows. That's not a really effective message or delivery. 
So we redesigned Azure CLI completely, rewrote it in a different language, and made it more powerful, more robust, and better. So it's designed to be more native to POSIX and should come naturally to all Bash users. So you can do things. So you can do things like AZ login or AZ group create. It's all very natural language. And there's wonderful documentation for even how to add additional switches, if you want to push a web app, if you want to specify a deployment slot. It's very, very natural. I do have demos of scripts that I talked about yesterday. They are also on my GitHub. Everything I write that I've contributed to projects, everything's open source, so feel free to play with it, throw it around, do whatever you want with it. Um, it integrates well with other open source tools that users typically use in command line interfaces. So I prefer to work actually in a ZSH shell. That was a question I got yesterday is what shell do I use? You see why probably in a second. But I have a bunch of customizations in my ZSH shell using oh my ZSH, Tmux, VI configurations, Nerd Tree. I have things set up for my interface and I can tie Azure CLI 2.0 right into it seamlessly. So these are the three tools that Microsoft has really focused on in the past year. .NET Core, by us open sourcing .NET Core, it set us up to be able to build PowerShell Core and Visual Studio, Visual, Visual Studio Code. So today's demo, I'm gonna use Visual Studio Code with the integrated terminal that has Bash right from it. And again, in Visual Studio Code, it does have, have GitHub <coughs> integration. So I can push, pull, commit right from Visual Studio Code to my Git repo, to Azure, and then deliver a website. So that's what we're gonna demo today. I'm gonna push to GitHub. I'm gonna connect GitHub over to my Azure subscription, which we're gonna just create a simple Azure web app. And right from web app, outside of using any CI CD tool, I can link it to my GitHub account, specify a repo. So that when I go and push it to that repo, Azure's gonna fire off that deployment for that web app. And you could make that a little bit more advanced and do de deployment slots. We don't have time to do that today, but we're gonna demo that and then we can go ahead and view the website. So let's go ahead and take a look. So the first part of it, this is my Azure subscription. These are resource groups. So I just wanna make sure we kind of cover something here. We're gonna make something like this, but uh, we're gonna do it brand new. So you'll notice that I have an app service, I have application insights because I wanna get metrics and logging, and I have an app service plan. But all three of these things are resources that are located in the resource group. So we, you can kind of think of a resource group as a container, but it's not a Docker Swarm container. It's, I call it a file cabinet. It just keeps things organized. It's like putting objects into a box. So the first part is we're gonna go over here, plus, do a plus sign. I'm gonna type in web app. And I'm gonna select web app. So we're gonna go ahead and create something new. Call it Linux Fest Northwest. Go ahead and pin it to my dashboard. I turned on Application Insights just because I'm interested in logging and monitoring. And press Create. Since it only has to create a few resources, it shouldn't take very long. I think when I tested it this morning, it took a minute, if that. While I do that, I'm going to show you what mm -hmm. I'm going to ultimately link it to. I have a blank, empty repository, Linux Fest Northwest demo, already created in my GitHub. So I'm going to copy this name. Uh, even though actually I don't think I'll need to copy it, but I'm gonna copy that and link it over to the web app that I just created. So we'll make sure if we go to our notifications, the deployment succeeded. So I can go right into the web app. And we'll see under here, deployment options, choose source. I have a few different sources. I could do GitHub, I could do Bitbucket, Dropbox, local Git repository, Visual Studio Team Services. We're trying to make a lot of options. And if I go back, each one of these sections are called blades in Azure. So if I go back to blades, I'll see underneath here something that's continuous delivery preview. I'll be honest and say I haven't played with it too much, but we're trying to also implement CD tools directly into Azure without having to use a third party. This right now would support VSTS. It is in preview. It's not necessarily ready for production, but it just shows how many new features Microsoft's adding in by the day. So for right now, we're gonna choose GitHub. If this is your first time doing GitHub, you will have to set up authentication. I already have my Azure account linked to GitHub because I've done deployments this way before. So we won't have to do any authorization. You'll see my account is already pulled up. If 
By the way, if you do want to follow me on GitHub or Twitter, it's JL Dean, two E's, no, related, no relation to James Dean. <laughs> I do get asked that, and then I question spelling differences. So now we're going to choose the, the project. So I'm going to choose the Linux Fest Northwest demo. That's the name of my empty repository. I don't have to do any performance tests because this is just going to be a demo, and I press OK. So it's going to set up the deployment source. So that's now where this web app is going to get its contents from that GitHub repo. So the next step of what I have to do, let me go over into Visual Studio Code. This is a local folder. Let me show you. I have hidden files available to view on my Mac. So let me show you this folder. There is no .git folder. It's not an initialized repository. We're going to start off and make it initialized. So let me actually close out of code real quick because I'm going to want to push from within Visual Studio Code. So I'm in this particular folder. We'll do an ls again. I see everything looks good. I'm going to do a git init. So I initialized it. I'm going to add everything in there. I'm going to do a git commit. And then I'm going to do a git remote add. I'm going to add the name of that, which is Linux Fest Northwest demo. I'm going to confirm that that added successfully, which it looks good. And now I would be ready to push. But I wanted to just get that repo ready outside of code. Let's go ahead and close that. So now I have a local repo that's connected to my GitHub repo. I can go ahead and make sure that I'm opening that folder, which I see right the third button, making sure that shows that third button, that's source control right there. So that's tied in to GitHub. And since I have this particular folder already open, and I can reopen it just to show you, since I have this folder open, it knows that it's a Git folder because it has the .git folder in it. So there's an index file in here. There's CSS content. There's a very basic overview architecture. Let me go ahead and push. Oh, has no upstream branch. Let's do, so pressing control backtick from within Visual Studio Code gives me the same terminal I just had. It gives me a terminal now into Visual Studio Code. So I can do git push origin to master right from within Visual Studio Code. So I can edit my code, and then when I'm ready, I can do it right from Terminal. So now if I go over here, refresh, I see that push. So I see the content exists. Now if I go to whatever the web address is, which looks like it's Linux Fest Northwest Azure Websites.net. This is your tube Linux Fest Northwest demo. So this is something I did mention yesterday. Uh, colleagues of mine at the beginning of March decided to do a hackathon where we had to tie in Azure and some intelligent media services. We wanted to tie in a bunch of different stuff. So we decided to make a bot that could pull YouTube content locally or allow us to save it. So this bot actually is using an Azure function. All I did was push the web framework. So I'm working with developers. This is a perfect example of DevOps and collaboration. I'm working with developers who wrote the Azure function C sharp. I don't code in C sharp. I don't know C sharp. I pretty much know the letters C sharp. <laughs> so they're able to write the function over there, host it in their Azure subscription. I, as previous, I do know some web code and web development. So I made the web interface here, hosted on my subscription, pushed it to my GitHub, connected their function in, and all I have to do is anytime I make local changes, hey, change the top red or change this graphic or make the format different, change the padding. I make that change within Visual Studio Code and say, OK, go ahead and push. And that pushes automatically to the website without me having to go upload code, get FTP involved, do anything crazy. So an example, let's see if we want to do, this was a fun one that everyone, how many people in the room have kids? OK, so I had no idea, not as many as I expected, but I had no idea what Doc McStuffins was, which I guess was a Disney thing. And so the demo that we did was you can talk, chat to it and say Doc McStuffins, and it will actually go back and give you three replies. You click on the link, it opens in a new tab, and you can right click and press Save As. This is a silly little demo, but it shows you the power of collaboration. It shows you the power of infrastructure as code. I will say sometimes the bot is a little slow, but it does work. Uh, let me try again here. Trying to do it on a hotspot Wi-Fi sometimes is fun. The actual site lives here. There we go. Doc Nick Steffens. So it gives you, like I said, it gives you three things back. Open the download link. It opens the actual raw data link. Could right click, save video as. 
So this is just, again, this was a project that we created and my job was do the web code and push it to GitHub. Okay, cool. So that shows one tool that we have, but if you also look, you have so many other options on here. This is where you can do backups, you can do custom domains, you can do SSL certificates. This is one of the benefits of platform as a service. You have uh, application insights. If we go back to our resource group and go back to this particular resource, you have your application insights in here. You can view metrics. You can view logs. You have your complete control from the GUI. Anything that I just did right now for the purpose of this demo, you can also script. So I could have pushed that out from Visual Studio Code using Azure CLI 2.0. I just, again, for the purpose of the demo, we just wanted to do something very simple. Going back to Visual Studio Code a little bit, if I wanted to make changes to CSS, if I wanted to make changes at my index, if I wanted to change the title, I could simply change that, re-push, it would redeploy. So let's go back to presentation. Let's recap. So we reviewed a lot of DevOps. We reviewed kind of the practices, what it is, what it means, and why it matters. So we were able to kind of set up the conversation for today for a demo of, hey, here's an Azure web app. Let's connect it over to GitHub. Let's do a deployment push. So we reviewed Azure and web ops. We reviewed Visual Studio Code and integration. One thing I didn't show you, which I will, just because we have a little bit of time and it can be fun. So you'll notice that my configuration in my actual terminal has, I don't know, very, a variety of, has the tmux thing down here, it has different uh, fonts and mm -hmm. colors and all of that. How I have it configured in my actual terminal is mimicked right down here in Visual Studio Code. All I did for that, because I can modify my workspace completely, is you can go into settings and you can actually turn settings on. It's, it's in JSON. You can turn settings on in word wrap. You can change the font family. I actually even have remote port, so I do a lot of SSH. So if I SSH into something and I want to open it in Visual Studio Code, I just type code the name of the file and it'll actually open it through that remote port. So I'm working on something remotely, but I'm working on it locally on my system. So you can modify that. I can change the font family. Right down here that I have actually commented out, if I wanted to start using PowerShell from this integrated terminal, I would just uncomment this line to, in, uh, to also integrate and change the shell from Bash to, or from Tmux to <coughs> PowerShell. So you have complete control over this tool, and the tool's getting updates all the time. You have extensions you can tie into it. The extensions are written from regular open source users that are pushing to the marketplace. I actually have colleagues of mine who have written a variety of tools of, hey, I think this would go really well in Visual Studio Code. Let me write something for it and make it available to everybody. So this is, again, just a review of one of the most powerful open source tools Microsoft has that we're really showing how we're partnering with the community itself. So going back to our recap here, in our demo, we again pushed a local web code, I would guess just the framework, to GitHub to fire off the deployment immediately in Azure for an Azure website. So the final part of it would be questions. I tried to leave about 15 minutes or so. So uh, you guys have plenty of time if you want to ask anything. So I, I actually you know, created a VM in Google Cloud and okay. installed uh, SQL Server and uh, just great. I'm trying to do a, use it as a, a back end for a Microsoft Access database actually. Um, so and, and so I think these are all great things and moves and the attitude change from uh, Balmer especially is great. But, and thanks for coming by the way. My pleasure. <laughs> but, but I think a, a big question, uh, uh, maybe the biggest question is, you know, Microsoft has for years had these, you know, uh, been trying to or extracting, you know, patent royalties from users of Linux. So why not just drop all that shit, to be honest, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's not like the company can't afford just to bite the bullet and, you know, whatever, you know, revenue they, they think they're owed, you know. So, you know, that, I think, for me and for a lot of folks, would be a real huge and significant <laughs> signal is that, you know, no longer is this company trying to milk its, uh, you know, <laughs> Not, Every not last penny. Not, not monopoly or almost yeah. monopoly position. And so, you know, that would, be, <coughs> that would be a real game changer. So when will that happen? So that's a very good question. That is well above my pay grade because I don't make those decisions. Sure, but when you but go back to Redmond. So I don't, I, so by the way, I don't work out of Redmond. I work actually, I'm, I'm a technology evangel evangelist in San Francisco area. Email back to Redmond. 
Correct. That's, I think, a message worth, that a question worth taking back, and they'll, they'll listen to you, and yeah. again, thanks for coming. I know you're... I can, no, I can definitely give that feedback. You're, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. I will say that I mean, with Microsoft joining the Linux Foundation, we paid half a million dollars to do that. I don't, from that move alone, I don't think our mindset is let me get every last penny, but I don't necessarily know about anything previously. Again, that, that conversation is well out of my pay range. I can definitely make suggestions and find the people to make those suggestions too, but that's not gonna be my area. It does start with boots on the ground, technology evangelists, me engaging with the community, coming to these conferences. So that's great feedback. I just don't have the answer for you. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't expect you to. Okay, but, I'm just, uh, I'm just. The, the feedback for you to give back is that yeah. me and perhaps others in the room. I, I said, would totally agree. Right. If you wanna see a real attitude change, yeah. put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. Right. So that the feedback you got from Linux Fest Northwest, part of it was from some folks is, Stop the patent bullshit. Okay, that's Thank great you. feedback. Thank you. Can you see a point where maybe Node.js might be added to PowerShell? <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, I know that right now, because my understanding from Jeffrey Snover, who is the fa father of PowerShell, when he released PowerShell Core, was he wanted it to play well on Linux system with other systems with other tools that already exist. So because you can already do Node development maybe in other tools, he just wanted to offer PowerShell Core as another tool set. I don't necessarily know if he has plans to actually add Node.js directly into PowerShell. I know that his big focus was making sure that you had another tool to use in conjunction with previous tools you're already using. So I can't give you a direct answer. What I can say is if you do have a suggestion or a, what, is, what do they call it? I think it's the uh, user voice site on Microsoft. You can actually make that request and say, hey, I would like this support, and other people can upvote it. And if other, if it, other people get enough upvotes, either a member of the community or the repo, there is a GitHub repo, PowerShell, forward slash PowerShell. You can also submit a pull request or a bug fix or anything of that sort, and other people will grab that and work on it if there's enough upvotes. Do you have to have a virtual machine on, let's say, just a simple scientific Python or a numerical Python application that has to run and quickly cr crunch numbers as quick as possible? You can do an actual a plan. I mean, if you, if uh, I, I don't think you can run Python as a service, but I know that you can create like an app service plan. So if you have a web app that does that, just that just calls a Python script uh, that just wants to crunch numbers, I know you could set that up through platform as a service. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried the second level of platform as a service where it does give you more control with startup tasks. So that might be one avenue. But I know that you don't have to just spin up infrastructure. The whole goal of platform as a service is you don't have to spin up infrastructure just for one task. Uh, I know that we also recently did SQL <coughs> Server for Linux. That's also now you can run as a service independently. So I'm sure at some point we're getting there where you can start running Python apps or anything of that sort as just a service and not just infrastructure. <laughs> we seem to be making that momentum. Thank you. Yeah. I hope that answered you. Uh, any any other questions about anything demoed here or even outside of that? I, I know a lot of people are just talking about Microsoft and, and open source and Linux, and that's okay too. I'll I'll answer what I can, or at least if there's feedback you want to give, I can mention it. Can't make any promises, but I can mention it. Thank All right. Thank you very much. Oh, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> Libre Office, Open Office, Microsoft Office. Uh, again, I got above your pay grade, but the things that bring back as feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I started out a long time ago and used, for good and for ill, my Microsoft Access. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to be able to um, really, for those folks who are still using, that I work with or for, to, or to consulting with, as a, a real back end uh, with a, a better than just an ODBC connection to MySQL, for example. Okay. Uh, so there's, you have, put out SQL Server for Linux, mm -hmm. you know, that's great. Uh, I forget the name of the tool for SQL Server on Windows Server that is not yet on Linux. I'm spacing on that, but it's, it's like a MySQL Workbench type equivalent. Okay, I was uh, just gonna say, because I've only used the SQL Server application where you have. Yeah, the, okay. the, so, um, uh, so you're, <laughs> you know, the, the, some of the golden eggs, the core, you know, money makers, uh, I think that would be another huge uh, signal that there's a sea change in Microsoft and mm -hmm. you know, open sourcing office, open sourcing access. Um, 
I can definitely raise those points. Okay. I don't know of any plans for that. I, I did hear mention that they're trying to make Office available in the store. Uh, so the Windows Store, so rather than have it be something that you have to go log on and either have an Office 365 subscription or pay for an individual right. license, right. Uh, something's moving into the Windows Store. I don't know any more information than just that. Right. So I, I don't know what future plans are. That That is above my pay grade, but I can definitely take that feedback and, and give that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is kind of like the, the culture at Microsoft sounds like it's changed, like the floodgates have been opened. And I'm, I, I'm a, the analogy that comes to mind is that at Google, they have like the 80-20 rule, like you spend your time, some of your time doing that's not directly work related. Yeah. Um, it sounds like Microsoft may have done this at some level at Microsoft where it's like, okay, you now have time to go work on open source projects. Did something like that happen there? What? It kind of, but it's not as definitive as the 80-20 rule. So I mentioned I'm based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Microsoft's campus that I work at in Mountain View is directly next door to Google. If I wanted to go have lunch with my friends who work at Google, which I, I do have, we, we can actually do that and not blow up when we're in the same room together. Um, but I, I'm familiar with the 80-20 rule. So at Google, it's very, very, we have this. We have said this. This rule exists. At Microsoft, it's a lot... It's more flexible. We're very, I've, I'm very fortunate to have managers that's very passionate about, you worked on the weekends, take time to do something during the week. We don't want you to burn out. Pick projects, we have these projects coming up. What project is something that you wanna learn that you're interested in? We have hackathons pretty much every quarter and we get to work with uh, new people where it's not an 80-20 rule, go spend 20% of your time doing this. It's hey, if you're going to this hackathon, work on something new, learn something new, collaborate with this person. So it's more so just encouragement of, you're passionate about this, Take it wherever you want to so take it. It, it, was a, it was a move from uh, management to really encourage um, going in different directions. Going in different directions, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I have connects or calls with my boss all the time, and it's th these are things that interest me. When I first started, there's only five te uh, IT pro technical evangelists in the United States, and I'm one of them. And so to kind of, IT pro is very, what, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about infrastructure, we're going to talk about cloud, we're going to talk about DevOps. We have five people that are all talking about the same thing. So the advice I got was, what's interesting to you that you can use to separate yourself and maybe do something a little different? And so I, my exact reply was, C can it be anything? Yeah. I was like, can I talk about Linux? Go for it. Okay. So it was really just, this is something that I want to do. I mean, prior to joining Microsoft, I was a Linux system administrator. I had an Apple for years. I had four Apple certifications. I worked on, on Apple, not for Apple, but I worked on them for a third-party service provider, and they knew that. They met me at a conference, well, I, I'd already been around, but my boss met me at a conference where I was talking about an open source project of running a web server to monitor your Nest Home thermostat and create a log graph. That was all open source on GitHub. So you know what you're getting when you get me. Can I still talk about that? Absolutely. Okay, so again, the, the culture change is surprising. Absolutely, and it was, it was surprising to me because this is, I've been in FTE for a little over a year, but I was a vendor to Microsoft since 2009. I was a Microsoft MVP for four years in Windows and devices. They changed the title every year, but it was ultimately Windows. So I was around kind of for almost the past, I would say about the past eight years. And this has been very different for me being a full-time employee and still getting to do what I did without getting a paycheck from them. So that's been kind of nice. It, it really is a very big culture change. And I can say that uh, I've, I've been to conferences where Satya is there, and the, the mindset that he has for this company and for what he actually wants to give to the community, to, and that's just beyond people in this room, beyond people in Linux. I mean, we want to get involved in, in medical and the, the strides that we're making there. It's, it's really awesome to kind of watch this shift and this migration, and it's starting from the ground, from the, from the top down. So that's where like, I got that directive, not from the 80-20 culture mindset, but from my manager, who got it from his manager, who got it from his manager. It really was something that had to trickle kind of down the tree. I'm just curious, is Steve Ballmer, is he completely detached from Microsoft? Yes. Yeah, otherwise, farewell. <laughs> I can't speculate necessarily why the shift has happened. What I can say and what we're told is we've, we just started to listen. 
I think it also, it did change when we had a, a new CEO and our CEO is now passionate about conversations and listening and encouraging. And so you guys have been saying the same things to us for years. The difference is we're starting to listen. We might not be perfect and I understand that, but we're starting to listen. So we're starting to be able to take what we've heard and show you that we're listening by making small strides. It might not be perfect again, but I do think that's where the culture shift has really started happening is once we have a new CEO, Satya, coming on board, that's really kind of started that shift of where we can start from the top to really kind of change that culture all the way down. And it's going to start changing. It started within Microsoft first before we can get out and actually change the perception in the community. Because that's the biggest part. We can stand up here and I can work for Microsoft all day long and say they support Linux. But if the community doesn't see that, that's where now we're starting to have a disconnect again. Kinect was the first Microsoft product that I willingly used. I like how you put willingly. And that was due to a Microsoft hackathon. We would like more of the hackathons on various topics. Customer Kinect, engagements. HoloLens. Mm -hmm. HoloLens is terribly expensive. That's another complaint. We, we have heard that too. <laughs> so working for them, we don't get any additional discounts. So we, we hear that. Uh, I, great feedback. I know that this past year, my team, so the team that I work on, I don't know how many people were in the room when I said it. I work for Developer and Evangelism Experience, or DX we actually get to partner with hackathons and show up at customer events. And our team, Microsoft actually gave resources to, to be able to help customers uh, achieve certain things with, with projects focusing in certain areas, DevOps, bots, conversations as a platform, cognitive services. We were able to take those areas that customers were interested in and have partner hackathons. So I did, it, actually I've been to Virginia, I've been to, what was that? It was a government comp company in Virginia. There was another one in Silicon Valley. Uh, there's ones that I know have been in Texas. They've been all over the United States where we do a one and a half day value stream mapping, which is another part of kind of DevOps practice. You kind of map out your current process so you can visually see maybe where the wastes are, heroic efforts, manual efforts are being made. You visually see that on, it's literally just pen and a giant post-it note on a board. And then you can take what you learned from that one and a half day and we would apply that into a hackathon and have a customer story at the end. So we, we were given those resources this year. I don't know the plans for Microsoft's fiscal year ends in a month, so I don't know the plans for next year, but if it's anything like what we've seen this past year, I, I'm sure they're gonna wanna continue that partner relationship. Or I can't say that I'm sure, because again, I don't, I, that's above my pay grade, but I would, I've seen success from it, so I wouldn't be surprised. Is Point Roberts in your area or city? Uh, what was the name? Point Roberts, Washington? No. Yeah, um, well, I mean, like, if, if it's in, like, it would be in the area city. that we can go. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm a West Coast evangelist. I cover California, Oregon, Washington, all the way about as west as Colorado. Uh, what, like I said, I did end up going to Virginia. That was a court project that they said, hey, who knows DevOps and can help do value stream mapping for this company in Virginia? Sure. So we, I mean, I'll go where essentially my company will let me go, but my actual region, it's myself and another person, we cover the West Coast. So that would be, uh, what I can do is I can give you my card at the end and feel free to reach out to me and we can talk. Thank you, thanks. What, what languages does the web service, the website service support? Or is it just <laughs> static content? I think it's, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. The only test deployments I've really done kind of goes into what my background and my familiarity is. So it'd be any web language. So I don't know. I haven't tried to do something with, say, like a Python app, but I would assume that since you can make websites in Python, that that would work as well. I just haven't tested that. Uh, this was obviously a very simple HTML website. But so long as it's web code, I would imagine that could work. I know you can also do like WordPress sites and MySQL and that. I've done those tests. PHP, yeah, I'm assuming any web language it would recognize. But I, that's a good question, and I, I don't know the definitive answer. Any other questions? We have another five minutes until uh, technically this is supposed to be over. So I can either give you five minutes back or <laughs> I try to leave. You never know what you're going to get, because usually it's two people raising their hand, and then everyone's shy. And then it's, OK, let's say goodbye. Oh, no, wait, now I have another question. <laughs> so I try to leave about 15 minutes or so, because this is a really big topic, especially at a Linux conference. So I want to make sure everyone feels heard. So are you someone also that, if someone's interested um, in uh, pursuing opportunities with Microsoft, 
and it, it, they don't have to be a white male, for example, or that can, like you can talk to them about that or can share your experience? Uh, so, okay, I feel like there's two different questions there. One was a question is, are you asking me about employment opportunities? Mm, not, not, not me, but okay. if, if, if someone other than me, someone other than a white guy, to be honest, who's okay. like looking for of your experience and opportunities, are you? Are so you I'm not the opportunities per okay. person. That's okay. going to be above my pay grade. If anyone's okay. interested in working for Microsoft, I, the same exact thing that was told to me, careers.microsoft.com. If you're interested in experience, because this is a question I get asked, I don't look like the typical IT. In fact, most people ask me if I seriously work in IT. <laughs> <laughs> so from an experience perspective, I can definitely give you my feedback. I've been around since before. We, we're now st starting to see more women, more younger women in IT, so that change has, has definitely happened. But I've been around since before that was more common. Uh, like, I mean, even though I'm young, my, I've, my first client, I started out private consulting. My first client was when I was 16 in high school, and I still actually have that client today. Uh, not that I work with them, but they still call me. So, in other words, I still have that relationship. So I can definitely give you my experience from back when you didn't see women in technology to now working for Microsoft, having a company that supports women te in technology. My team alone, that DX team that I mentioned, over half of us are women. And I'm, like I said, I'm the only IT, so that means over half of us are developer evangelists or game evangelists or are women who code. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, one more thing, if anybody wants to grab a picture of this slide, this is my blog. I blog about different content. Uh, Twitter, my GitHub, you can email me anytime. I do also have Channel 9 videos up here. I actually have a video for people who want to, or previously Windows Systems Administrators, and want to learn Linux, uh, how to do that in Azure, so there's a video on there. Regarding point Roberts, yes. Point Roberts, which can only be reached by driving, you have to go to Vancouver to get in point Roberts. Oh, okay. Uh, and there's a non-profit run by a Manhattan Project physicist, okay. Jack Lubczynski. Okay. Started.